If I could just give a piece of it, following up on Vivian's uh, little thing about the seahorses. If, if, the pro if the product could tell us what not to say or how to approach these subjects with our kids, my daughter asked about space travel recently. She's four, and apparently I mentioned that spaceships have blown up before. <laughs> my wife goes, she's, did you tell Ellie that, that spaceships can blow up? I think he wrecked her, her dream of going to space. So, anyhow, don't, don't do that. Um, so, Andrew, it's nice to, nice to be here and having this talk. Thanks. Good to be back. <laughs> um, so, I, I, you know, given the audience and the subject of the conference, which is deep learning, I don't think we need to dive into, like, what is deep learning, you know, and, uh, but I, I do want to ask you something we were talking about earlier, and as I see the brain logo on the, <laughs> on the conference, I'm like, um, you know, maybe we can start off by, I don't, I don't want to say dispelling, but, you know, you have an idea about shifting the, the analogy that we usually use to talk about oh. <laughs> deep learning, so. Sure. So I think, uh, what, maybe five, six, seven years ago, when a bunch of us were starting on this, we used to explain deep learning as saying that it's a neural network, kind of simulates the brain. Uh, one of the problems with that analogy is it has led to an excessive amount of hype. Uh, with people thinking about, oh, we're going to build super intelligences and similar human brain. And of course, all of us that work in deep learning just know that's not true. And uh, Mike Jordan likes to say that deep learning algorithms are really a cartoon of the brain. And, and I think that's accurate. Um, so, you know, recently I've been uh, to, to, to lay audiences been uh, uh, trying out a new analogy. So, if, so you can't tell people, don't think of it as not a brain. That's not helpful. So now when I think about building deep learning products, I think of uh, building a rocket ship. So what is a rocket? What is a space shuttle or like a Titan rocket? Um, it's a giant engine and it's a lot of fuel. That's basically what a rocket is. So I think of deep learning as being something similar. Um, we need a giant engine. That, that's the giant neural networks we built, the big iron that can absorb huge amounts of data. And the data is a rocket fuel. And so I think because of a lot of uh, computer systems work, um, uh, we're now able to build these giant machines, giant engines. And because of the digitization of a society and, and other tactics, we now have huge amounts of data. And it's a combination of these two things that lets us launch more and more rockets and have them go further and further. All right. Do, do you get a, is it a, I mean, so I want, I want to talk about both those things actually. Um, f first of all, on the data front, uh, the fuel, I guess. I mean, is, is it kind of a, a virtuous cycle of when you're in the web, like, you know, the more people you get doing voice search, the more people you can convince to, you know, use these new interfaces, the more data you get to train the systems, or how do you, you know, get data <laughs> that much fuel, I guess? Yeah, so, you know, what, one interesting thing that's happened with the rise of deep learning is that uh, for many applications, we're now able to build these giant machines that are able to absorb more data than most of us, even leading tech companies, can easily get access to. Um, and. Uh, uh, we used to have this idea of the virtuous circle of AI where, you know, you build a great product, it gets you lots of users, it uses generates data, the data helps you make your product even better, it gets even more users, and you kind of go round and round and, and, and all of these things have a positive feedback. And all of these... Let me try speaking more. And all of these things have a, have a positive feedback effect on each other. Um, that hadn't worked until recently because if you look at the older generations of AI algorithms, even as you got more data, the performance would get better, but then plateau, right? As if the older generations of algorithms didn't know what to do with all the data we could feed it. And so deep learning algorithms are really a class of algorithms, uh, maybe the first I've seen in my career, right? Where uh, as far as it would have been able to measure, um, the more data you feed it, the better it gets. And so it's both keeps getting better and better. And I think that is today uh, letting you know, tech companies, for example, um, start on this virtuous cycle. In this interim period of time when we're just powering up this um, positive feedback loop, I am seeing a um, number of efforts use very innovative ways to acquire huge data sets. Uh, and so I think in computer vision and in speech recognition at Baidu, other organizations as well, have been aggressively pushing the envelope on data augmentation. So take speech recognition. In academia, the largest data set is about 2,000 hours uh, uh, for speech recognition. Uh, we start off with 7,000 hours of data, so you know, quite a bit bigger than what you see in academic data sets. But we said 7,000 hours isn't enough. So what we did was we took 7,000 hours of audio data when building our speech recognition system, and we added all sorts of noise to it. Let's add 
car driving noise, restaurant noise, crowd noise. And so we took that 7,000 hours of data and synthesized about 100,000 hours of total data. And so we train our speech systems on about 100,000 hours of speech data, which is way more than you, know, you see in like pretty much any academic paper. Um, and that was the secret sauce, really. Uh, that our rocket fuel, the 100,000 hours of data, together with our big iron, our um, large investments in GPU clusters, supercomputers for, for deep learning, is a combination of the rocket engine and the rocket fuel that I think allowed us to have what I think is probably a state-of-the-art uh, speech recognition system today. I wanted to ask about the, the supercomputer that you just mentioned, because I think that's you know, one of the more interesting papers I, I've read in a while. Like, I mean, what was the... What was the impetus to say, you know, I, I guess at Google, you know, you're probably building on more of a distributed sort of, you know, cloud system, right? And then all of a sudden you go and build a, a supercomputer with high-speed interconnects and, you know, InfiniBand and like the whole nine yards. Like, what was the, what was the rationale behind the supercomputer? Yeah. So I guess, you know, um, it's interesting that I've, I've been seeing a shift in the center of gravity of the uh, technology that powers deep learning. So several years ago, 2011. Um, when I had started and was leading the Google Brain team, at that time Google's deep, main deep learning team. Um, oh, and I think later on you hear from two members of, of uh, Greg Corrado and Kwok Le, who were two of the earliest members that I recruited into, into the team I was leading at Google. So I'm excited about the work they continue to do. But when I started the Google Brain team, uh, the center of gravity of that team was using cloud computing in order to scale up deep learning. We said, Google has a lot of computers, let's use Google's computers to build giant neural networks. And Google is a fantastic cloud company, and we use fundamentally cloud computing-like technologies in order to scale up deep learning. So it was very successful. I think was, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that the team did when I was there, and that the team even continues to do today without me. So that was very successful. Um, more recently, I've been taking a different approach, where instead of relying on cloud technologies, we were relying on HPC, or high-performance computing, or so supercomputing technologies. And that's actually a different group of people, different skill set uh, you recruit from different venues. And so um, uh, Baidu, many of you know, was the first company to build a large GPU cluster for deep learning. But it turns out that these two technologies are pretty different. If you're running a cloud computing shop, uh, you might distribute your jobs maybe across a thousand servers. Um, and, you know, if mean time to failure of a computer is three years, right, most of our desktops and laptops fail after three years, if you're running a thousand computers, it means about one computer will die per day. And so if you're using cloud technologies, you need to worry about computers going down and, you know, unwinding the, the like, if you have a thousand machines and one fails, how do you recover from that? So a lot of the complexity of the work that my team did at Google when I was leading the team was uh, dealing with these cases of, like, you know, machine failures and, and, and other things like that. In the HPC, high performance computing world, uh, you have a much more modest number of servers, uh, but, and, 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 but, but you kind of don't worry about them failing. So that, that's, a more, uh, that's a different approach that we're taking at Baidu uh, using HPC technologies. Um, but then we worry about other things like the uh, latency hiding and fast networking, fast interconnects. Um, and so I think that that latter approach uh, has allowed us to scale up our deep learning algorithms you know, pretty aggressively at Baidu. How, how does that, I mean, I'm just curious, I mean, does the, does the tight connection between the systems and the fast, the, 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 the low latency, I mean, how does that affect the actual, how the algorithms are running? Yeah, right. So actually, one of the, um, one of the things I learned, uh, uh, both when I was um, uh, running the Google team and now uh, building a new uh, team at Baidu, is that uh, computer systems is really important for deep learning. And so, uh, uh, so actually, on both of the teams I led that I've been leading, um, there has been a tight collaboration between great systems researchers and great AI researchers. And um, it's really that tight connection. So I, I should tell how, how, how I think about my job at Baidu. Um, you know, my mental model for the job of a machine learning researcher, right? if you're a machine learning researcher, what do you do? Um, sometimes you have an idea. You then have to express your idea in code. Uh, expressing your idea in code allows you to run an experiment and then you see how your experiment goes and this gives you additional information that causes you to have better ideas. And then you kind of go around that cycle, express your ideas in code, run the experiment, get better idea, and then you kind of keep going round and round that loop. Um, so when I think about my job uh, in terms of designing the, the deep learning team at Baidu, um, I obsess a lot about um, having the systems team make it really efficient for machine learning researchers to make progress through this very iterative empirical process of designing learning algorithms. So what does that mean? One, it means that we obsess about writing great developer tools so that um, it's really efficient for a machine learning researcher to express your ideas in code. That's one. Two, 
some of the experiments we, we, we run, you know, they used to take like two weeks to run. Um, and so uh, we are also obsessed on building HPC supercomputers in order to bring down that iteration time so that you can get a result back in you know, three hours instead of a week. And that again speeds up your progress as a machine learning researcher in terms of how quickly you can get your results back, get better intuitions, get better ideas and iterate. And, and, and then anyway, the, the, the last thing I do is, you know, like where do ideas come from? The last thing I do at Baidu, um, I think I did a good job at this at Google too actually, uh, but uh, was um, in, invest heavily in employee development. And so uh, everyone talks about employee development, like, you know, train employees. Maybe because of my background as a co-founder of Coursera, um, uh, I, I have a certain understanding of how to develop employees and make sure that everyone learns. Um, and so at Baidu, I've actually never seen any other organization uh, engage in training employees as intensely as we do at Baidu. It's one of the things we obsess about. People read papers all the time, share ideas all the time. We really value employees teaching each other. We've designed tons of processes uh, based partly on the lessons I learned working on education for several years at Coursera to make sure that you know, every member of the team is learning rapidly. Uh, so I, I want to touch on that actually, like, you know, that's kind of a two-pronged sort of thing. Like, one, like, so I'll ask you the two-pronged question. A, how do you actually, like, where do you actually recruit, right? How do you build? Because like 18 months ago, it seemed to me like the, the, the story you would read is, you know, deep learning is so hard and so new and there are seven people and like 20 other students who understand it and they get paid, you know, gazillion dollars a year. And now everyone seems to have, you know, like you're, some, everyone has an opinion and understanding. Some sort of, I'm, so I'm curious, like, where do you actually get, you know, when you look for talent, you know, how do you look for the right people? And then B is, like, if, if you're a novice, if you're trying to learn, you know, really kind of get into deep learning, can you learn the fund, is there a place to go to get the fundamental skills that maybe can get you a job or at least get you <laughs> functional? Sure, right, so let's see. Uh, so where do we get people to join Baidu? So, um, uh, turns out that, you know, from a machine learning researcher perspective, it turns out that um, if we offer a machine learning researcher the best platform, because of all our systems investments, our employee development investments, um, if we offer a machine learning researcher the best platform to make rapid progress in machine learning, that's actually an appealing prospect to a lot of machine learning researchers. So, you know, we've been an attractive employer for machine learning researchers. Uh, for systems researchers, why do people do, to a lot of HPC supercomputing researchers, um, there's a sense that this is the time. Like, you know, traditionally supercomputers were used to do atomic bomb simulations or whatever, and you know, maybe, maybe that's okay. But now, supercomputer technology, the GPU clusters, fast enough connect, uh, latency hiding, the crazy complicated scheduling work that they've done, that is having a huge impact on AI, which I think will change the world. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, supercomputing researchers, HPC researchers, the, the opportunity to do that work and have a huge impact on the world has been very appealing as well. And so we've been attracting from industry, from top universities. Um, we've not had a huge, I, I, we've not really had a huge problem recruiting. Uh, uh, and I think also people know that if they join Baidu, we're very efficient. Because of my background in education, I can vouch for this. We're one of the most efficient organizations in the world for teaching you to be great at deep learning. Uh, and so the combination of those things has made Quite a lot of people um, want to. It seems like this. on the job training. If you get a smart enough person, you can teach them what they need to know. It's, it sounds like, right? Yeah, yeah, and and and, and, and teach them all the lessons I learned. So it turns out, uh, uh, websites like Coursera. You know, as an educator, um, we're pretty good at teaching facts. You know, like what's the state capital of Montana? Right? Facts like that. We know how to teach that. We're pretty good at teaching procedures. You know, like how do you implement this thing? How do you implement Quicksort? We know how to teach those things. Um, in education, what we find harder to do is teaching strategic skills. And by strategic skill, I mean as a deep learning researcher, every day you wake up, you know, your neural network trained the night before and something happened you're in some totally new situation that no other human has been in before. So what do you do? Do you get more data? Do you add, plot the data? Do you visualize this way? Do you read that paper or try this other thing? So that's a strategic skill. Um, the education system so far has found it relatively challenging to teach strategic skills relative to facts and procedures. And I think the best way, frankly, the only way we know how to teach strategic skills is by showing you example after example. Uh, this is why MBA programs, business schools, uh, use the case method, use case studies. And so, um, uh, to show you example after example of corporate strategy, and you, you kind of pick it up. So what we've been trying to do at Baidu is systematize um, the process that lets employees join us and see example after example so that after a relatively short period of time, you will have seen tons of these examples and be able to make those strategic decisions. Um, the other way I like to think about this, you know, think of it as um, uh, 
we train airplane pilots in flight simulators because if you stick a pilot in an airplane, in, in a normal airplane, you might need to fly for decades or years or something before you see the emergency scenarios and decide what to do. Uh, but if you put in a pilot in an airplane, in, in an aircraft simulator, you can show them tons of examples of things that could go wrong. The air, you know, a wing falls off, so maybe hopefully not. You know, engine dies, or some fuel <laughs> thing, a like right. brake problem. And so you can show them tons of examples. And so we try to do that for the employees that join us to show them tons of examples, so that in a relatively short period of time, you can be in that compressed learning environment. Uh, uh, like, a, like a flight simulator of great at deep learning, so they can acquire these skills deeply. So uh, kind quickly. of, I mean, if, so, if, if, so if you want to get into the space, it's kind of like learn machine learning, and then hopefully <laughs> you go somewhere where they'll teach you. I mean, could you go to Coursera and, and learn, you know, deep learning, whatever, the, you know, the fundamentals of deep learning is that? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, if, if, actually, if you're starting out and you want to learn, learn the foundations of deep learning, uh, uh, at uh, Stanford, uh, my, my team at Stanford had put a lot of work into designing a tutorial, so deeplearning.stanford.edu, that's the URL, deeplearning.stanford.edu, this tutorial that lets you learn the basics of deep learning. Uh, Jeff Hinton also had a course on Coursera, where I think his videos are still up. So that will teach you the basics, the foundations of deep learning. Tons of people have worked through the Stanford tutorial and a bunch of a few other things. Uh, but then to learn the strategic skills, sadly, I think right now the most efficient way to do that is probably still to join one of the top deep learning groups, but it'll, it'll be interesting to see if uh, uh, there are other ways to teach that more broadly. All right. And um, I want to save some time for audience questions in a little bit, so if you have some, start thinking of them. The clock, our timer stopped like a minute and 56 seconds into it, so I'm just, I think we have about 12 minutes left, if I'm, <laughs> I'm correct. So, um, but what, so, so, so my last question before we kind of open it up here, I just had, had one more, and that was, you know, the, the other thing you read, I think, is, this is tied, I think, the super intelligence comment you made before, but, you know, like, like deep learning, not whether it's real, because I think, I mean, you said, <laughs> so that's probably not the case, but you know, you get this idea like deep learning is overhyped a lot, right? And there's, there's a lot of that. On the other hand, like at Baidu, you're actually running stuff in production based on deep learning. So, I mean, I, I, my sense is kind of that it's, it's overhyped depending on how you're selling it, but if you want something that's effective at, at doing stuff, it probably, <laughs> it, you know, is the right tool. I was wondering if you could talk about the, the stuff you're actually running at Baidu, you know, and the types of things you've built and productized around deep learning. You know, so, uh, boy, Baidu has tons of products and, uh, uh, and services in production that use deep learning. Uh, we have a lot of image services. You can query by image. If, if I, actually, like, I think that's a nice sweater. If I take a picture of your sweater with my cell phone, Baidu has a relatively unique feature. They'll use deep learning to recognize the sweater and try to tell me where to buy a similar sweater. So tons of image products all powered by deep learning. Um, some of our web search, the advertising on Baidu is powered by deep learning. Uh, I think we were the first company to figure out how to do deep learning on advertising, make it work really well. And um, uh, we, we've talked about this probably before, but you know, this has a significant in impact on revenue. Um, one of the things that Baidu did well early on was I think internally there was a team uh, that built a very effective deep learning platform that opened up deep learning all across the company so that any engineer could uh, use state-of-the-art deep learning tools run on our GPU servers, either in um, training or in production and testing uh, 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 in order to train deep learning algorithms for very, very diverse sets of applications. One example we were chatting about earlier was, you know, one of our engineers in our um, infrastructure team decided to use deep learning to try to predict when hard disks will fail. So today we can predict with like 75% recall or something uh, if a hard disk in our data center is about to fail. And so this helps us reduce our data center operations costs and increase reliability service to users. And this is an example of the sort of application that I, as a machine learning guy, I, I would never have thought of doing this, but by building a platform and empowering uh, engineers all across the company to use these tools um, that enable all sorts of applications to flourish. So deep, so deep learning today uh, uh, is, is, is used by a lot more products um, all across Baidu than I've been able to keep track of, but there have been a few key ones uh, like speech recognition or image products, advertising, a few ones that have uh, had, a, had, a, had a huge impact. All right, cool, and so with that, I think we have about 10 minutes, so if anyone has questions, all right, I'm just gonna, arbitrarily select, I guess. So I'm gonna go with second row, yes. In an ideal sense, what for you is the holy grail for machine learning and AI? And on the flip side, what might be the worst case scenario for it? Yeah, this is a great question. Right, so uh, we're just chatting about the super intelligence thing. You know, um, 
almost all the value of deep learning today, not all, but almost all, is supervised learning, right? If you have a lot of training data, X, Y pairs, deep learning algorithms are very good at absorbing a huge amount of labeled data, inputting X, Y pairs, and learning that mapping. And that mapping can be images to, you know, object recognition or, uh, uh, in, I guess, our recent announcements, I think we now have to save the art result in ImageNet, so that'd be one example. Or speech recognition, where we input an audio clip and output the transcript. Or I think, uh, 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 actually, my former PhD student, also a member of the Google Brain team, has done very interesting work on machine translation, where you input an English sentence and output a French sentence or whatever. So deep learning is amazing at supervised learning, which is a very narrow task. Um, in the next future, in the near future, I hope that we'll make more progress on unsupervised learning because even today we have a lot more unlabeled data than labeled data. So I hope we can absorb more unlabeled data and just have computers learn more about the world. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I, I, I think the, uh, and I think this vertical of supervised learning is incredibly valuable. Uh, I think that at Baidu, we've been making great progress in speech recognition. We're making it work in noisy environments way better than anyone else. And I think this will transform the mobile internet. Imagine if all of you could talk to your cell phones, uh, even in noisy environments, and just say, even when you're driving your car, and say, hey, cell phone, please text my wife. Let her now be five minutes. It will totally change the way we interact with technology. So I'm really excited about that. But I think the next few phases of between what we can do to the you know, super intelligences uh, of which there is a fair amount of hype. Um, I, 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 I honestly don't see a path to get there, um, uh, and so I tend to less worry, worry less about the evil killer robots. Um, uh, having said that, there is one uh, worst case that, that does concern me, that I think is a serious concern, which is the impact of technology on labor. Um, so uh, uh, labor, you know, as new technology is created, on average, it makes society so much better, you know, empowers individuals to do so much more. Um, but there is something different about this time. So the United States took about 200 years to move from about 98% farming to today less than 2% farming. It's about 200 years. And what that meant was that um, uh, the descendants of farmers had to do something else, right? Uh, because the farming jobs were all going away. But that was okay because we could, our education system was sort of up to the task of training the farmer's children to instead work in services or in other things. But this transformation, uh, I think, will be much faster. And, our, and, and, and so uh, we might be in a position where if, if, if we succeed in building self-driving cars, you know, that's 3.5 million truck drivers that might have to find different employment. And our education system has historically found it very difficult to retrain people that are already alive today to do a different job, as opposed to training their descendants. So that's one of the reasons I was excited to you know, work on Coursera and MOOCs and so on. Uh, and I think that might, that, that's actually the best shot that I'm aware of right now of addressing that problem. But that actually deeply concerns me that even Coursera and, and, and things like that might not be up to the task of retraining so many people that are already alive today. Um, and the reason I get irritated about the discussions of superintelligence and evil clear robots taking over the world is I think that's a distraction from the conversation about labor, which I think is a serious issue that serious government and business uh, 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 leaders should have a serious conversation about. And I think the, the evil killer robots taking over the world is, un is an unfortunate distraction from that. Right. Should I have a lady in the front row? If there is a single algorithm for intelligence, what would you say the constituents might be? And how would you compose, say for example, like a coherency bridge um, that would um, compile the different approaches in speech recognition, image recognition, and text recognition into you know, a single data set that is comprehensible across you know, all of the deep learning. You know, I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, what we have today are giant supervised learning algorithms that happen to be very effective, but backprop, backpropagation, frankly, I'm highly skeptical that the brain you know, does, does, does anything that similar to backpropagation. So I think that, uh, 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 actually, neuroscientists believe that the brain does much more unsupervised learning than our algorithms do. Uh, we've had little inroads, little hints of what might work. I think uh, Bruno Oshausen at Berkeley has done fantastic work on sparse coding. I've been a lot, very inspired by his work. But I think fundamentally, we, we really have no idea, like almost no idea, how the human brain works. And today, I don't feel like I really know what the, you know, one algorithm of the brain is. Right. Uh. I'm gonna mix it up, <laughs> corner. Uh, 
I recently um, read about the uh, deep learning machine that you built called Minwa, right, the supercomputer by Baidu. Right? And even with that type of processing power with 30, uh, 32 servers, it would take what, eight to you know, 10 hours to train the machine, right? Do you see like, quantum computing you know, uh, would have a role in that, you know, improving, you know, have a, the next quantum leap of processing power? Do you think? Yeah, there is a great question. Um, so, so far, I see, a, you know, so far, I think there's a large gap between what I'm seeing in quantum computing versus what uh, deep learning, machine learning researchers are doing. You know, um, those of us that are building this stuff and shipping code, um, uh, we engage in certain activities and use certain algorithms. Unfortunately, because of the, like, frankly, hype about deep learning, uh, there's been a lot of work on, you know, usually under the banner of neuromorphic computing, and the logic goes, deep learning is inspired by the brain, uh, we do stuff that's inspired by the brain, therefore neuromorphic computing has got to take off same as deep learning, right? But unfortunately, so far, there's actually been a, been a, been a, been a gap between what a lot of the um, neuromorphic computing, as well as some of the quantum computing, the work that they're doing, there, there is a large gap between the capability of those computers and uh, what deep learning algorithms, the, the, those of us that are shipping code are, are doing today. Um, and I think, uh, uh, and then just to refer, you, you mentioned the Minwa results. So I think, uh, what was it, like uh, about two weeks ago, um, let's see, so until recently, the best performance on ImageNet was 6.66% by Google. About two weeks ago, we announced we had 5.98%, so best in the world, best published result on this large ImageNet classification benchmark via a supercomputer that we built a little, little bit outside Beijing. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I view deep learning and computer vision today as in a state where um, the technology is amazing. Computer vision works so much better than it did like three or five years ago. Um, one of the challenges, frankly, is we can compete. You know, yeah, we're better than everyone else. Maybe someone else will say, oh, now we're better than Baidu. I don't, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll do those benchmark things. I think the challenge for computer vision today is a product. So. Um, this technology is amazing. How is it actually going to change users' lives? So in the uh, AI lab uh, in, here in Silicon Valley and Baidu, we say that our mission, our mission is to develop hard AI technologies that let us impact hundreds of millions of users. That's our mission. So if a technology doesn't have a potential to impact 100 million users, um, we're less likely to want to do it. Oh, and Baidu today has 14 mobile apps each of which has 100 million users or more, so that's not hype, right? We, we actually, it's not easy to have that level of impact, but there's a reasonable level of impact for us to aspire to, I think. But so I think one of the challenges of computer vision is that as amazing as the technology is, um, uh, and, and even though we compete on these benchmarks and you know we're winning now, maybe someone else will win in the future, I don't know, uh, uh, the challenge, in my opinion, is figuring out where this technology, for computer vision specifically, will be most useful. For speech recognition, I think there's a very clear case. But for computer vision, uh, just outside, Derek and I were chatting about Orbius, which you know, has a bunch of interesting ideas, uh, uh, and I have a bunch of other friends in various startups exploring ideas, but I don't think we've really nailed down what is the killer app for uh, computer vision yet. All right, and I think we're out of time, um, but there's like a million questions left. So, okay, okay, maybe we have time for one more. Do we have time for one more question? Is that all right? Okay. And also, I would say, if you go and search, just read the, the quantum computing question. Um, I think Microsoft Research published a paper about quantum deep learning a couple months ago. So if you go and search, you might be able to track that down and get something about it. So anyhow, okay, one more question. Uh, and, and Derek wrote a nice paper, uh, uh, article on, on, on that thing, on the Minwa thing as well. So read that article. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, the gentleman in the second row. In a commercial application, I could look at a credit card transaction and decide is it fraud or not. But if I'm doing intrusion detection in a computer system, like over eight months where targets infected, you know it, it needs some investigation. And so deciding where to look to analyze, um, to investigate uh, things like that, maybe like a Bayesian network on top, and you uh, make some assertions, and then you check to see uh, if some conclusion is true. You know, some kind of planning system on top of that. Has there been any? Applications like that or development um, projects like that? Yeah, so let's see. In academia, um, uh, there's been interesting work on deciding where to look. I think Jeff Hinton uh, wrote a bunch of interesting papers about this. Uh, so I've seen um, papers that tell a nice high-level story. Um, I have 
yet to see, this is just my opinion, others might disagree, I've yet to see anything that I found totally compelling. So uh, in, in deciding where to look, there's a story that the human fovea or the human eye actually sees a tiny fraction of the world at a time and we need to look around, you know, in order to assimilate the total scene of what's around us and so should computers do the same. Um, but the, the, but it turns out that one of the reasons the human eye sees such a tiny area at high resolution and everything else right further off to the size is blurry is the physics of the eye. Um, at the back of your eye is an optic nerve, this giant bundle of fibers, and as your eye turns, it's actually heavy to drag the optic nerve around, and this limits the amount of information you can get from your eye to your brain. And so um, it makes sense to have a really high precision area called a fovea, and then lower res everything else, and then you point your fovea around by foveating, looking around. Um, so that story has inspired a bunch of you know, basic research work on deciding where to look. Um, and there is a computational reason where, you know, if you can only compute on a small lower res image, you should pick out which regions to compute on. So there's all that chatter, all that discussion, and the story hangs together at some level. But um, if you have a supercomputer, if you can suck in the whole image, without the restrictions of an, an optic nerve that your eye has to drag around at the back of your eye, and if you can computationally afford to process the whole image, uh, how critical is it to, to, to decide where to look? Uh, I, I've yet seen an answer that I find totally satisfying for that. So uh, these sorts of techniques, we are not heavily focused on um, we use them in some of our algorithms, and it helps us speed up our algorithms computationally. So we do use some of these some of these ideas, but I don't think anyone has really like nailed the answer to that question yet. All right. So I think we're only 20 minutes over the original time. So you'll have to swarm Andrew in the hallway. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thank you.